Two. All right, welcome. Okay. Hey, Joe. thank you. We are, we are now live, live streaming from the Social Assurance Global Headquarters. But it's so fun to have you here in Lincoln. Uh, what, like, what brought you to Lincoln? Well, how long have we been trying to do this? I think forever we talk about we need to do some kind of gathering and discussion. So I'm here in Lincoln today to speak at the Nebraska Bankers Association. I think it's their Retail Marketing and Ops Conference. I don't even know the official title. And I'm going to talk about kind of the trends going on in retail banking for 2023 and beyond. Awesome. Well, you know, yeah. uh, for, for everybody who's who's following, many of you uh, in the banking community know you, Joe, uh, because you've been well traveled to a lot of conferences. Uh, you've hit conferences all over the country. Uh, and uh, and the, the nice thing is we've been able to stay connected through a lot of those and keep uh, keep in contact because we sort of overlap at a lot of these conferences and we usually find a place to grab a great cup of coffee. We do. And we did that this morning. Uh, so so good to have you at my home coffee shop. Mills uh, Coffee, I must admit, it was delicious. The Italian roast pour over, it was great. <laughs> awesome. But, you know, we, you know, I usually get some questions from, uh, from some of our attendees that ask me things like, hey, what should I be, uh, you know, I'm trying to think about new things, uh, I've been promoted into a role or I've changed positions. And so I know you talk with a lot of strategic planning groups. You're spending a lot of time in leadership development. Uh, one of the sessions that I love that you give is about human connection. So I'd love to, for our listeners today, lay out some of those opportunities to be able to talk about uh, sharing uh, the, you know, the different opportunities that you have to share in this various spaces, but one of those being this leadership development area. Okay. Um, tell me a little bit about how you got into, into banking in general. How did you get into, uh, you know, where you're at with, with banking? What, what happened? Well, how did I get into banking? Okay. Uh, the power of a mentor. And I was telling you recently that my mentor, when I got out of MBA school in the 19, whatever, um, I met this man who was running a retail bank consulting firm. And it was one of those where you worked a billion hours, you traveled all the time and made a dollar. And it was the, the most fun job I ever had because I learned so much. And so that really launched me into my passion for speaking. Uh, it launched me into this idea that um, getting an outside point of view from a firm who can look at a situation objectively uh, is something that a lot of banks need. So we worked with banks and credit unions then. Uh, he, you know, we all moved on from that firm. And I, after spending some time at the accounting firm of Crow, I started my own company. And it, at December 10th of this year, it will be 30 years. Wow. So uh, I always say that uh, the only job I could hold on to was the one I created for myself. So it's a joke of I fired myself from all the other jobs. So that's how it all got started. Um, and I just loved it. I knew it was where I needed to be that, you know, if we can shift mindsets, if we can help people take an, a step forward to move forward, to improve their bank, improve their credit union and do it with data and, and back it up with solid research and information about the market, um, it gives them a base from which to move forward and take action. So that's kind of the, the purpose of Market Insights is really to shift the mindsets to get people to take action, to evolve their business, their business model if they need to, in light of ever-changing market conditions, whether that's demographics or technology or new competition or any of those. Hmm. Now, your formal training before that, was it in banking? Uh, no. I've often said my claim to fame is that I have never worked for a bank. So uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm dating myself on this one, but I started uh, out of undergrad with uh, Inland Steel, and I sold steel for a distributor out of Detroit and ended up going to MBA school and I specialized in finance. And then ultimately I went out and got a second master's degree in psychology and I'm also a licensed psychotherapist. Uh, Fascinating. Well. So yeah, kind of an interesting combination. So this, this human element has come both in training as well as experience. Yes. And I would say it's mostly experience because none of us need a master's degree, a bachelor's degree, or even associate degree to connect with others, to, to listen, to encourage people or businesses to tell their story. Uh, that doesn't take any degree. I just think it takes a, a little bit of empathy on all our parts and we all have that. Mm. 
Fantastic. So, uh, so let's talk about you. You you have this background in some in some fascinating industries that's prepared you uh, for banking, and and then you uh, you end up with a mentor who guides you to speaking around the country and then really helping uh, banks and credit unions to analyze the changes that are coming uh, for them. That's right. Uh, so you, you've been analyzing changes for a long time. Mm -hmm. Have some of your prophecies come true? Yes, I remember, uh, and they're not entirely mine, but this yeah. idea that the bank branch is like, well, why are we going into this thing? Because even in the early 90s, technology was already coming on the scene and you could see where things were headed. The idea of bill payment and some of these things were already starting. But um, did a prophecy come true? maybe just from the standpoint that it's going to continue to change and evolve no matter what it is. And the best we can do as a business, as a human being is to, to say, all right, I'm up for the challenge of seeing where this goes and to embrace as much of this change as possible. And I think that also that, um, I think it's, it's human nature to be in stasis and to maybe resist change. And so if all of us, your company, my company, any of us can help people navigate the change that's coming, the better off they will all be and we will all be. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if I answered your question on that one. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, you, so you kind of mentioned the branch. You, you sort of said maybe maybe some thoughts you had in the even in the 90s about whether or not we were going to spend more time at branches or less time. You could see that trend evolving. You know, in, in my company, we started out as a company that would do site selection for branch expansion. And uh, while there's a little bit of that going on, yeah. what we've seen, and this this was early, early on, is you have to optimize the experience. You have to change it based on consumer behavior and how things are shifting. And back then, that was called the branch of the future. And the branch of the future was basically moving from a transactional model to a sales model. And you might say, but we're still dealing with that. We are because as an industry, the banking industry, and I, I kind of put credit units in there, financial services, we're still dealing with um, this obsession with the transaction. And the pandemic released consumers from the need to do that, to go to a bank branch for anything. You heard it from Joe, we are living in the future. Uh, we, are. we are we are now there and as long uh, as there's good coffee i'm there you know <laughs> fantastic yeah. uh i think that's a trend that's going to continue yeah. uh so when we think about um the the work you're doing with a lot of client work um help me understand a, a little bit of what that looks like i know some of that's working with leadership teams in areas of strategic planning but if we back up from there in leadership trends what um you know, I, I know we had some people that actually even guided us to some of the topic we were going to talk about, which were, which were saying, hey, I'm now in a position in which I have the first person reporting to me. Um, what does that look like and what sorts of coaching would you do for people that are in that type of situation where maybe they've got their first, uh, first person who's reporting to them? Uh, what would you tell them? Get to know the people you work with. Get to know the people that report to you. Find out their life story. Find out what they're passionate about. If you can tap into the idea of passion, no matter what it is, if you like to cook, like we were talking about that with your wife, and I'm way underestimating what she does, but if you like to run or play golf, find out what people are passionate about. Because when you do, it wakes up this level of energy. It's like this energetic vortex and it comes alive in them. And if you can tap into that, every person in your office that I see here probably has a different passion. And when you can tap into that, the barriers come down about what they think they should do and who they think they should be within an organization. So it really is relational. It is just knowing people and being excited for whatever their passions are. They may not be yours, but when you do and you show that, they feel acknowledged, seen, heard, and listened to by you. And when they do, they're gonna they're gonna show up for you in many, many ways that are good. Yeah, yeah. You no, being the leader of your department or whatever this is. 
I think that's a that's a fantastic example, and uh, we certainly see it in the in the people you met already this morning here exactly. at the office that uh, yep. have a variety of different interests. Now, when you start working with a leadership team, uh, you know one of the the challenges sometimes is that you you actually don't know all their interests walking in, right? So you're walking into an environment where you've got a leadership team that you don't know. How do you build trust? Build the uh, a, a sort of pathway to getting good strategic planning done. You know, good strategic planning is, is all about the advanced preparation that you do to prepare people that are going to be part of this process. So um, strategic planning in general is not just this event that an organization will do once a year, but it's rather strategic thinking. So what we do when we work with an organization, and we've done a lot of work outside banking because every every banker that we work with sits on the board of some organization and they're like, Joe, can your team come in and do this? But uh, I want to make sure that I'm not, not going to lose my train of thought. When we do planning with a banker credit union, we spend time, usually four to six weeks in advance, uh, learning who the stakeholders in the room are going to be. Is it a board driven or staff driven um, plan? So what we can do if the client wants is help them pick who should be in the room. Mm -hmm. And what we do are some discovery sessions up front where we ask them questions. And first of all, we might ask them something as simple as an icebreaker about tell me one thing you're passionate about, something you love to do when you're not at work, just to warm up the space. But then we start getting into uh, asking questions like, you know, what's what's a pain point that you need to solve for your customers? And we want each person to weigh in on what that would be if your plan could only cover one thing. Now we know a plan will cover many more than that, but then you would come, if you worked at Bank X, you would say, from my perspective, uh, this plan should cover X. The head of retail might say something else. The head of marketing might say something else. But what you do is then everybody's put their cards on the table about what they think is interesting and important. And what you do, you'll get a whole list of things. We'll put them up on a digital whiteboard or a paper whiteboard or whatever we're working with. And what will start to happen is you will start to coalesce around some some themes, but you do all that before you come to the formal planning session. Then what we do is we craft then an agenda for planning day that is tight and focused around specific um, big ideas and and action steps to get there. But it all starts with that advanced preparation. And there might be some assessment of the market data, and there might be a, a look at data and analytics about their customers, their behavior, whether it's segmentation or whether it is looking at the transaction and say, who's using the mobile app and 87% of your customers aren't using it. That might be an issue. So we start to look at relevant data points, all this done in advance so that we can guide a planning session that is not dragged down in the gutter with mission, vision and values. Those things are important but they shouldn't be part of the planning day when you're trying to decide what are some of the key big ideas. So I, I could say a lot. I like going. that a lot. Um, one, one of the things that it's drawing me to is I, I think about, I'm gonna be vulnerable with you with our own leadership team because uh, we have a lot of different personalities on our leadership team. Uh, myself, I, I speak a lot, I, I move forward. I, I'm usually pretty quick to talk and pretty quick to respond to ideas. Uh, but what I've started to realize is that we have different personalities on our leadership team, some which will be reserved and all of a sudden they'll come in with this sort of nugget or sometimes hammer. Uh, but they come in later and then say, and then you think, what I needed, I needed to get to that before. Right? I needed to get to that earlier in the meeting rather than relying on. Uh, people who would operate like me that would say, right. hey, I'm going to be quick at it. And in a room full of people, I'll, I'll sort of debate you and we'll own it and we'll sort of go back and forth. And, and what you're telling me is that there's some areas that you're doing to help negate that. And I yes. think we've all seen that in a board meeting. Well, number one is the, the leader per se. We would invite you to share your ideas last. Yes. to get everybody else to go first. The other idea of working in a discovery, you can call it whatever you want, advanced preparation work, discovery, whatever words you choose. You can also see who hijacks the conversation. There's going to be certain people that will always go first, and I'm not saying that's you, 
but you can see these dynamics and that is what we prepare for. So my colleague, Jim Perry and I, we often do these planning sessions together and play good cop, bad cop. And um, I usually get the bad cop role for whatever okay. reason. But um, Well, I mean, Jim's really nice. Yes, yeah, so, yeah he's yeah, a nice guy. Yeah. And, but anyway, but the point is doing all that in advance, we get to see who's quiet, who's not, who drops those little nuggets that are probably the most important piece of information that you need to know. Yeah. And so that we can design, um, like in a planning day, uh, it's it's unconventional. It, it, I hate most planning that banks do. It's just, or strong word, ineffective. But what we can do is uh, design exercises, dyads, triads, group things that they can do to solve a problem, come up with an idea, find out what the first few action steps are. But so while it may come to planning day and say, well, this felt really simple, the work that we do on the front end of that starts with all that discovery work that we did six, four, six, eight weeks ahead of time um, so that we can set the stage with the right kinds of interventions, for lack of a better word, that will get the job done, get people talking, um, keep us out of the mud. You know, we try to, again, you know, it can go down into these conversation threads that are not going to get you where you need to go. It's our job as facilitators to back them out of that, to say, okay, let's stay focused on the things that need to be done um, so that you don't come out of here with an 88 page strategic planning filled with all this stuff and nobody does anything. At the end of a planning session, people should be focused on two or three key things and everybody knows what they are. And they can walk out of that room in one sentence, be able to say what this plan is about. That's where you get buy-in because everybody's clear. They have a shared sense of vision regarding it uh, because they've got skin in the game from day one. Now, I, I know we can't uh, we can't afford to hire you for every meeting that we go into, those hour meetings where we're trying to be tactical and strategic at the same time. But what I like about the way you're talking about that is that could be applied to the everyday meetings that Absolutely. I have. Um, Absolutely. How do I think, how do I operate strategically, pull that information out so when we enter the meeting, we actually have some some pre-planning. Those, those wouldn't be 80 pages. Those right. might be a brief, essentially, right. like a, a paragraph. Yeah. And your plan, it, in the simplest form, should be boilable down to one page. Um, there was something I was going to say, and I forgot what it was, but it'll come back. Um, It'll, it'll come back. Yeah. So, so as you're, I know part of your work isn't just coaching leadership teams. You're also coaching individual entrepreneurs, individual bankers who are uh, maybe growing in their leadership roles, a number of different aspects uh, uh, like that. What, uh, what does that look like for you in thinking about how you coach and train? What, what's a model uh, that you think about when you're coaching and training individuals? Well, first of all, I've noticed that the people that have approached me for coaching, it started during the pandemic, individual coaching. I've always coached bank presidents, okay. but uh, solopreneurs and some of these other companies, um, everybody says, well, can you give me your spreadsheet? Can you give me this thing? There's, they expect to be able to just plug this in. So like what we talked about during coffee this morning is I like this idea of helping people think things through. So if you run a bicycle shop, or whatever it is you do, and you've got some ideas. Sometimes having a neutral third party objective point of I'm view. I'm Kristen Sunday. She's got. She's that's got exactly what I was thinking shop. of. That's okay, exactly okay. what I was thinking of. In, in the brain, I'm like, oh, you don't look like Kristen. So we've got this mutual friend who runs a bike shop exactly. and also in bank marketing. Fantastic. Exactly. But the idea of thinking things through. Sometimes we have all these ideas spinning around our head. We don't know where to start. So I think simpler is better. Okay. So first, let's think things through. And I asked them some of the same questions. If you could do one thing over the next year to grow your business, what would it be? And they'll say X, but then I don't have this and I don't have these resources. I'm like, okay, forget about that for right now. Yeah, maybe you'll need to hire somebody that has some talent that you don't have, or maybe you'll need to write a copy or hire a copywriter or use chat GPT, who knows? Um, but think things through, put a couple of ideas, some things on the table that they want to do, and then I'll guide them through some simple things like what's the first one or two action steps that you would need to take. And they always know what these things are. 
It's like, it's not unlike being a good therapist. You're just drawing out by asking questions. I'm not devising the plan for them. So, you know, what's one thing you want to do? What are the first one or two action steps that you can take? Okay, when are you going to do this? Um, how are you going to measure whether you're successful or not? How are you going to measure success? Your success is our first follow-up. So I put it on them. And those are not unlike the very same questions that we ask a bank or a credit union when we do planning. Yeah, It's all the same. We as humans tend to overcomplicate everything and it doesn't need to be. So simpler is better. It's the way you get everyone on board if it's a bank or credit union to understand. Um, if it's an individual business, again, a summary on one piece of paper that they either print off and put in their cubicle or they have it on their screensaver, uh, simpler is better. Did I answer your question? Okay. Uh, yeah, I think okay. you did. And I think um, in particular, I, I want to ask the follow-up question, which is some uh, some of us at times don't feel as strategic as we want to be. Uh, what would be your advice in that space? Focus on, first of all, the why. You know, you know who is it, Simon Sinek, that said, you know, start with why. But... Find the purpose, and I speak a lot on purpose, and you know that. Yeah, I would think you got to start there. If I'm a bank or a credit union, why are we here? It's not to sell people checking accounts. It's not to give them a mortgage. It's something deeper than that. You know, something about community needs, something about empowering people, whatever it is. So start with the why. What's our purpose in doing this? And you got to back way up. And they might say it's to make money. No, it's not. Money is a byproduct. It's a measure of doing some things right. But what are those things and why are you doing them? So I think to think strategically, you start with why. Um, I also think thinking strategically is about thinking in terms of pain points for the customer. Not, not necessarily a new idea, but every bank or credit union has primarily the same products and services. Um, you can't compete against the mega banks, but what you can do is figure out what the problems are that you need to solve. You know, and, and you've probably heard me say this before. My favorite story is still Uber. And, you know, how did Uber get started? Because two guys in Paris some night in November 2008 on a rainy night were trying to find a cab and nobody's picking them up. And one said to the other and said, what about if we could order a ride from our phone? And that launched it. So this idea of a pain point, I think that's how you think strategically. That's how fintechs have grown. They picked one pain point. They've solved it with data and technology and good marketing and got it out there. And then they move on to the next one. So thinking more in smaller buckets, because if you think in pain points, you're going to solve the actual customer problem. Mm. So those are two ideas I have. So, so you've got this uh, you know, idea, which is finding that problem. And then also when you talk about the human connection, uh, I think that's a lot of how we do beat uh, the big banks is that human connection. I think that's a lot of how, how we compete uh, with fintechs and how we how we engage, but but what are what are your thoughts on that space? Well, I have for more than five years now. I've been discussing the idea of human connection and banking, and what we tap into there first is a core need to be heard and seen and listened to. To acknowledge that every customer has a different point in the journey. When we can make a connection with them whether having a discussion about their family or what they're passionate about or what their vacation's about. So I think um, that is very important um, as a starting point. But ask me the question again so I can... Yeah, you know, I mean, think human connection is, is a core competitive advantage for a lot of small and regional community banks. Um, how, how do you feel? Do you, do you feel like it's a competitive advantage? It can be. But it has to move beyond, we are, um, we've been in business since 1900. Sure. Um, because it is that core human need that we all have. It's a level playing field. But you have to back that up with your role as a bank, as a problem solver, as coming up with a solution that can make their lives better and get them where they want to go. But when we feel more connected to people, um, I mean, how many times have you heard, I hate Congress, but I love my congressperson, or I hate the big bad bank, but Ben works at Bank of XYZ, mm. therefore I'll follow him no matter where he goes. That connection is what builds the trust, uh, right. that relationship. You know, I bank with a big bank and 
the team that I work with there are great. When I have a problem, I don't call the 1-800 number, I call them. And they know my story. They know my life story. They know my business, you know, all of that. So I think bankers, and I've, I've said this a number of times more recently, the role of a banker is so much more deep and profound and important than whatever is printed on their business card mm. because they're, they're a relationship coach, their financial expertise. They're there to listen. Sometimes people just want to be listened to. So getting back to your question, can human connection be a differentiator? Yes. As long as you back it up with action and don't get into the, 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 the typical talking points of our business has been in, 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 in ground, you know, on, on earth since God put dirt in the earth. Well, nobody cares about that stuff. They want to know what have you done for me lately? You sure. Know? Sure. Well, I, I think about it in terms of, um, you know, the human connection we have over coffee this morning, right? It was great. Um, yeah. We don't uh, sort of talk about, we don't go back to, well, now, Joe, when did you start your company? And when did, you know, sort of like those those typical talking points that you would talk about a brand, we talk about, wow, you're headed out on a trip. Uh, where have you been lately? Like, yeah. What are the things that are that matter to you? What, what do relationships look like to you? in your personal life, your professional life? We tend to, I think, compartmentalize our lives into the work bucket and the home bucket and the education bucket, whatever it is. And what you just said is we just have to get back to having conversations with people about people. Fine, you, you have a job at the bank or you have a job in a digital agency or I have a job as a speaker or as a consultant but we have all these other things, these bundles of passions and needs and things that we like. And I think frankly, this is what bankers need to get back to. I think sales training has been done ad nauseum. That's not what bankers need. They need schools to know how to connect with others. And they do it, it's already there. It's like this concept of leadership. This is already there. Their ability to be empathic is already there. They just maybe need to be reminded of how important this is and the bank or companies that truly lead teach their people that this is important that this is a skill that's important because if we can have that relationship with customers we can figure out everything else mm. yeah I, I think that's fascinating so you know you're speaking today uh on the marketing track of the two-day conference right. yesterday was operational Today, you're talking in the marketing track. Uh, what are the things you're going to talk about today that you, you feel like marketers need to hear? Well, and I, I don't even remember the exact title of my speech, but it's it's about the top trends that are really defining and, and transforming retail banking in 2023 and beyond. So I'm going to talk in five major areas, and there's a lot of content here. Yeah. Um, I'm going to talk about consumer behavior and how that has changed exponentially. I'm going to talk about technology and some of the new technologies that are out there to help banks and customers or credit unions and members uh, engage with each other. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about product innovation. We're going to talk a little bit about, um, you know, being more operationally efficient. And finally, uh, this idea of talent. So there's all these areas and like any other speech with a lot of content, I'm going to encourage people to take one or two nuggets that's out of there and, and leave the rest for another day, but say, okay, there's one or two things that I heard Joe talk about today that in the next 30 days, I'm going to build a plan to get something done in one of those areas, because if they don't walk out of there with something that they're willing to take on, then fine. I was, an interesting speaker, I hope, and informed, yeah. giving them good information, but they got to take action on it. Mm. So it is going to be about, um, again, we study markets, demographics, segmentation all over the country. It doesn't matter if you're in the smallest town in Nebraska or a suburb of Boston or anywhere in between. Uh, consumer behavior is shifting in very similar ways about more self-service, taking on more responsibility for their own finances, using technology, wanting a different customer experience, wanting one that's more humanized in the digital front, all those things. So we're gonna talk about each of these and after each trend, I'm gonna give them some things that they could do at the bank or well, at the bank here in this case. 
shouldn't say Freddie Newman here, with, with yeah. Ron at the Nebraska Bankers. Oh, uh, well, and you're, yeah. you're speaking at the NBA the, yeah. the day after uh, LeBron uh, got the scoring record. So, I mean, you know, that's quite a time to, to be at the NBA. So Nebraska Bankers, uh, fantastic Ron and, and Richard, huge shout out to them. Um, yes. They've come over for our tailgates, which is fun. Um, so, you know, when we look at um, some of the trends you're talking about, you're talking about some trends in technology. And then we talked about this human connection. Uh, I, I want you to talk about the tension between these because they seem to be at odds with each other. You know, I'm, I'm asking an AI machine to write uh, some scripts for me. And at the same time, I've got, I, I want to humanize my content more. Um, you're telling me that uh, the branch is less important in person, yet I want to have really deeply personal connections and conversations with customers. Uh, how do we how do we balance those two extremes? Well, they're not mutually exclusive, and we may always be fine tuning and learning how this part is done. How do you digitize the human experience? You know, the in person, and how do you do just the inverse of that? Um, but maybe I'll start here. I'll say with the branch and work from there. That the branch is not dead, but. It's, it's changing in its purpose. Again, so the, the credit union interbank needs to ask, what's the purpose for this branch? And how can we bring more technology into it? So think about, it seemed to happen a lot during the pandemic. You know, we'd go into a restaurant. Remember when we were allowed to walk back into a restaurant? Sure. And was there a paper menu that was handed to you? No, there was a QR code that you scan and you pull up the menu. And, and a lot of restaurants have stuck with that. And I think, why do we need a paper menu? That's one example of how you're bringing in technology into that human experience. But also if you think about chatbots and intelligent digital assistants and chatbot meaning that basic thing that can allow us to uh, get our questions answered about hours and locations and some basic things using technology that keeps the customer very happy because they don't have to wait till nine o'clock when the bank opens the next morning to get their question answered or the digital assistant that was really pioneered, at least in my mind, by Bank of America and Eric, Erica that got started, um, that takes a little bit further and can really tap into what the consumer's intent is behind that and engage more with it and get more information. So it's becoming more conversational. Um, and I think the, the tools are gonna increase and be more effective um, as we go forward, they're going to become more human. And now I guess I, I'm going to forget the name of the company, but now taking it even further where it can personalize that even further and say, hey, it's going to rain. It's 47 degrees in your town today. Make sure you wear a jacket. Um, that yeah. we're, we're never going to get there because when we get there, the goalpost has moved further down the road. So again, I hope I'm answering your questions, but I think it's this continuum of all these things that we can do and the question we have to ask ourselves at every turn, regardless of the channel, is are we engaging? Am I engaging with Ben? Is my bank engaging with Ben? Is my connection with Ben as a personal banker, say, am I hearing what he needs and what he's not telling me directly? And even, you know, I read something about even chatbots are extraordinarily popular with uh, folks of lower socioeconomic means. Any guess as to why that is? Yeah, I mean, I, I would think that some of it's because it, it gives you some customer service that you weren't used to having before. And yes, that is true. And also the fact of maybe they've got some shame around money or their credit mm -hmm. score. And so sometimes they feel more comfortable engaging with a chat bot instead of having to look at their banker yeah. across the a screen or across the desk. and. And I say, what's wrong with that? If it, it gets um, a group of people further, more engaged in their own financial lives, and if a chatbot is the way to do it. So I think there's no one size fits all. There's no one solution to all of this. I think that, again, everything is going to get smarter and more tailored and more humanized as we go along. But what we're trying to help our clients see is if you are not 
taking those steps now. If you are not embedding video inside your mobile bank experience or your mobile app, and if you're not using chatbots uh, as a starting point, you're missing a key opportunity to connect. You're uh, providing a lower, more cost-effective, more operationally efficient way to serve customers um, that we've got to help them get there. You know, I, I think about it. I, I often ask my dad about what his background in finance was, mm -hmm. you know, through the decades. And he, he was telling me a story years ago about in the 80s. He said, I had saved a few hundred dollars and I wanted to go buy some stock mm -hmm. in Chrysler at that time. Mm -hmm. And he said, so, you know, I, he said, I, I read the story and I felt like they were going to they were going to pop like it was going to come back. And at that time, he had to go drive to uh, it was Fred Morgan Stanley or something. In that panel there. station wagon that I right? saw you yes, speak about. Yes, yes in so, one of your so he sort of like drives in, you know, in his station wagon or whatever to, you know, to go buy stock. And he said, I, I sort of opened in one of those rooms, like our office here, where you can sort of like open office. And he said, I, uh, I said, I, I needed to look for the youngest person there because I didn't want any static back. He said, I, I didn't want somebody judging me and trying to look for their commission. I just wanted to buy the stock and leave. Mm -hmm. And I thought, how different of an experience is that judgment today uh, where much of that is happening online? And now when I go meet, you know, if I go meet with financial advisor or my banker, they're not talking about that transaction information like he was worried about. We're actually having a conversation about real things. Um, I met with my banker two days ago. We had coffee. Um, it wasn't as good as our coffee this morning, but we had coffee and we, we talked about, you know, what he's doing in, in life, how he's serving his customers, how we're going to grow. And we talked about a bunch of life goals, things like that. Uh, none of it was transactional. We are moving. And I've seen this parallel in other industries as well. Like even within healthcare, we're moving from transactional to relational. And I think that bankers need to sort of forget about everything they've learned um, about relationship banking, but focus really on relational. So it is that continuum of transactional to relational. Technology at its very core freed up bank branch staff to be able to do just that. But what you're getting at is with your banker or your advisor is having coffee you're just having a real true connection with them. And I'm guessing that you trust the information that he suggests to you, correct? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so the industry at its very core, and a lot of people have moved beyond this, but we have to let go of the transactional dependency around which the banking model was built, yeah. uh, around which those branches were built. Um, because what you just described is this core human need that everybody has, you and I all have it, um, is this ability just to connect and explore these ideas and talk things through with people. That's where I say the role of a banker is a, an extraordinarily important one. And it's so much bigger than like what I said a few minutes ago than whatever is printed on their business card. Because whatever the connection you have with your banker, that's not on his business card, but he's just there to get to know you. And when he knows all of you, and the whole picture of Ben, um, he can be his best self and, and bring his best expertise to the game, but he's got to know the whole picture and not just what the segmentation code or whatever's in the data file in the MCIF says. It's got to go deeper yeah. than that because it's a story embedded in every demographic and every household address and every zip code. Mm, I like that thought. Uh, you know, I think of it too in terms of, yes, I, I meet with him. Uh, and the way that he builds trust is different than the way the marketing department helps him build trust. And I think that's, a, you know, obviously something I, I enjoy discovering and, and talking through in those senses. But you're also building that when you're looking at the strategy from uh, the leadership role. How do we help inform marketing of those sorts of conversations, their importance, and how do we tell that? Uh, so from a marketing standpoint back so that um, so that he as a banker can right. can really have that story of the bank told in a deeper way. That's so, right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's fun to see how those work together. Mm -hmm. um, now we talked uh, at our open a little bit, and you said you had some prophecies, maybe or some predictions about branch that were changing in the future. 
I want to hear a little bit of where you see things going uh, after after seeing some of these evolutions uh, in banking. Where do you th see things going? What is the future of banking? If, if we're living in some of the future you saw then, wh what's the next five years? What's the next 10 years looking like? You know, and, and not new themes for any of us that have read anything or attended any conference, but I'm going to, the phrase that I have often said, um, and I'm going to say it again, banking is something that we do, not necessarily someplace that we go. Banking is a verb, not a noun, and it is a platform, not a place. So we could go into, it's gonna be more about embedded finance and, and the idea that bankers are gonna become more the invisible partner and be the, the sponsoring bank so that a, a business that has different kinds of customers can offer a financially related product. So you're gonna see growth in banking as a service and, and you're gonna obviously see more in digital. But I think that, how do I say this? There, there will be some role of the branch. There will be some branches around. You're going to see a lot more consolidation because that's going to be necessary in order to develop the necessary scale in order to compete. Um, you're going to obviously have even stronger, robust digital offerings because more consumers, regardless of demographic cohort, are going to um, be wanting that. I think, um, again, I think it's more about this idea that that banks are going to be offering their services to other businesses and use their back end capacity to be able to do that. Um, those are my initial thoughts on that. Hmm. Yeah, no, I think those are those are fantastic trends. You know, thinking about that transparency of, hey, there's going to be a a frontline business that a lot of fintechs are tapping into, mm -hmm. but they're connecting with a real bank on, That's the, right. on the back That's end. Right. And I, we're seeing uh, tons of great examples of that, uh, right. whether it's banking as a service or, or whether they're just operationalizing some of uh, those banking elements. That's those right. Are fantastic ways to innovate. Um, the human connection. I love that you said banking is, uh, is not just a place. Right. It's right. A, it's a thing that you're doing. And I've been saying that for more than five years. And so I, I still think that's going to be the case. And where practically where we see that playing out in the work we do at banks is 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 doing an optimization study and looking at what ha what has to happen to this network. Is there a consolidation of locations that they need to do? And so one of the things that I've said, and I said this to a group of bankers in Vermont last spring is consider potentially closing a location that is is not profitable, uh, doesn't have a good transaction mix and take the overhead from that location and reallocate those funds, that capital, that working capital into digital and staff training and marketing. So at the broader level, that was my long winded way of saying, there's gonna be a reallocation of capital priorities that banks and credit unions are gonna need to make and just reallocate things and not just say we've always spent X dollars in this bucket and this bucket, reallocate that so those dollars work better for you. Yeah. And I think that's that's going to be a, a big part of it. No, that's great. Um, Joe, thank you for being here. Uh, really appreciate your friendship. It's, it's fun to talk yeah. about um, where you're headed, how you're caring for other people, how you're interacting you. with those around you. Really fun to see. And uh, and love your thought leadership. Uh, good you. luck this afternoon. Thank you. Um, I, I'm sure we've got uh, some of the Nebraska bankers folks uh, jumping in as well. Uh, so you'll you'll catch up with them this afternoon. But thanks for being here, Ben. Thank you. It's my pleasure as always. And I love our our coffee chats and um, just the the light that you are in this industry. And um, it's it's great to be uh, among company like you. So thank you, among friends. Thanks, thank you, Joe.